Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Um, hey, good morning. Thank you for coming on out in the cold and the rain. And um, we're going to do what we always do here, which is to open up God's Word, and we're going to get after it. We're going to ask God to teach us and to speak to us. So if you have a Bible, why don't you take it out and meet me in the book of Ruth. Meet me in the book of Ruth, and today we're going to be in chapter 2 and chapter 3. Um, as you're turning there, there's all kinds of um, genres in Scripture. So there's like these letters that teach us great things about the heart of God. And there's uh, music lyrics, for example, written in the book of Psalms, and we see the, the deep emotions of people. And today, actually for the next two weeks, I'm so excited about this, we are going to see, everybody look up at me, ready? We are going to see... A beautiful, amazing, romantic love story, okay? We're going to look at a love story that could only uh, be written by the Lord, all right? We're going to see a guy and a girl. They're going to meet. They are going to date. They are going to fall in love. Um, and I've got a few motivations for these next couple of weeks. First of all, for the, the singles in the house, okay? Young men, young women, singles in the house. Um, I pray that you would see some of the characteristics that we're going to see in this relationship. And you would be like, that is the kind of guy that I want to be. Or ladies, that is the kind of guy that if the Lord would allow me to fall in love, that's the kind of guy I'm holding out for. Or that's the kind of woman I want to be. That, those are the characteristics that I would see in someone that I would one day fall in love with. Okay, um, if you are married, uh, I hope that these next two weeks, you know, put a little spark in your relationship, like light a little fire. Okay, we're gonna see, we're gonna see a little romance. It's an awesome, it's an awesome love story. And then for, for everybody here, you know this, but let me say something that we know. When we look at the Bible, when we look at the Old Testament specifically, every symbol, every character, every verse, everything is meant to whisper and point and reflect to the great big heart of God, to the great big story of God. So please hear this for every person in this room. There is a love story, and you will find yourself in it, okay? Because what we are talking about is going to point to the Lord, all right? So Ruth chapter 2 and chapter 3. Now, uh, we've been in the book of Ruth, and let me just kind of let me kind of recap where we've been uh, for chapter one before we go a little bit deeper, okay? So, so you can look back at chapter one. Let me give you just a little bit of a summary of this story so far. Um, this story begins with a family in Bethlehem who made a terrible decision. You remember? It was the time of the judges, okay? And it was a time where people were kind of like, God, we don't know if you're real. We don't know if we want to follow you. I think we'd kind of rather do it our own way. Thank you very much. And there was the discipline of the Lord, and actually there was a famine in the land, and this one family, and this one guy whose name was Elimelech. Do you remember that name? Elimelech, whose name means, my God is my king, basically said, yeah, right now I'm not going to live my name. Uh, I'm going to do it my own way. And instead of saying, God, I repent, and we want to follow you, and we want to trust you, he's like, I think we're going to do it our own way. And he took his wife, Naomi, and his two sons, Malon and Kilion, and they said, we're going to Moab. And if you remember, Moab was like the epitome of sin and the epitome of like life far away from God. They're like, we're doing it our own way. Thank you very much. We're going to go live in Moab. And if you remember, that decision followed with 10 years of like total destruction. All right. They get to Moab and Elimelech dies. Malon and Kilion marry these two Moabite wives, which was against the law back then because of the evil of the times. They both die. And suddenly, after 10 years, you've got this widow named Naomi, and you've got these two widows uh, named Ruth and Orpah, and they're like, we are destitute, we're widows, we're hungry, we're in Moab, we're foreigners, everything is going bad, and then the story shifts because they hear that the Lord has visited his people back in Bethlehem. Okay, so you remember what they decided to do? 
Naomi says, okay, we're going, we're going back. We're going back to the Lord. We're going back to the land. And they get up and they begin to go back. And Ruth and Orpah begin to go with them. And Naomi is like, hey, stop. Don't go with me. We are, we are widows. There's nothing for us there. Don't go with me. And Ruth and Orpah are like, no, we're going. We're sticking with you, Naomi. And Naomi says, no, listen. Like, like, let me be very, very clear. We have nothing back there. We are widows. We are coming home, and there is nothing for us. We have no hope. The only hope would be, and this will be important for later, the only hope would be if we had a kinsman redeemer, which, which again, listen, because this will be important for later, which would be, you know, a person that is a family member that says, though your husband died, though you have no one to provide for you and protect for you and be connected to you, I will step in the gap and I'll pay a price to make you my wife and I will provide for you. I will protect you. But Naomi's like, we have no kinsman redeemer. Like, we've got no hope. You need to stay back in Moab. And you remember what Orpah did? Orpah's like, okay, uh, thank you, Naomi. I'll stay back in Moab. I'll go back to my life that is known, that is more safe. I don't want to go into the mysterious unknown. And she kissed them goodbye, and she went back to Moab. And you remember what Ruth did? Don't miss this. Ruth said, actually, I'm choosing to cling to you. And Ruth gave the most beautiful verse in this entire book. She said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm with you. Your God will be my God. Your land will be my land. Where you dwell, I will dwell. I'm following your Lord who is now my Lord. I'm with you. And Ruth clinged. She would would cling to Naomi. And we we left these last couple weeks and we said some things like, hey, everybody, I'll say them again because it's so important. Ready? When times are mysterious, when you don't understand God, when you're struggling, please hear this. Don't drift to Moab. All right? Like, don't say I'm doing things my own way. I'm turning my back on God. It will not ultimately go well for you, I promise. Number two, here, we've said this both weeks. Ready? Don't be an Orpah. All right? In the middle of our American soft culture that says, God, I'll follow you unless I don't understand and things get tough. Then I'm kissing you goodbye and I'm doing it my own way. Don't be an Orpah, but cling to the Lord. Trust him even when it doesn't make sense. All right? And so chapter one ends and it's very bleak, okay? Here's our situation. We've got Naomi and we've got Ruth and they go back to Bethlehem. They are widows and there are two great problems in the text, right? This is what we said. There's two great problems. They have no provision. They have no connection. They've got no food. They've got no family. And they come into Bethlehem and everybody's like, Naomi's back. The pleasant one is back. And she's like, Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. I went away full. Now I'm empty and I am bitter. And they enter Bethlehem and our story begins. Chapter 2. Everybody ready? Everybody there, by the way? Chapter 2. Here we go. Chapter 2. It begins. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And you're meant to just pause in the story and say, wait, what? Like, is something changed? They get to Bethlehem and they realize there is a relative, and I want you to circle a couple words if you have your text with you, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech. Okay, so first of all, clan. Uh, you know, in the ancient world, you had your immediate family, and then you kind of had your extended family, which is like cousins and uncles and like, like your big old family. That was the clan, and then you had the tribe, okay? Clan was like your extended family, and they get back to Bethlehem, and there is somebody that is of the clan, and you're meant just to pause and say, huh, well, maybe... 
maybe there is an extended family member in this story. I don't know. Secondly, you see, he is a, look back at the text, he is a worthy man, okay? A worthy man, that could be a reference to sort of wealth and means, but very specifically, much more likely, it means his character, okay? This is a man named Boaz who has great character. He has godly character. This is the same Hebrew word used uh, in Judges chapter 6. You remember the story of Gideon where an angel of the Lord shows up, looks at Gideon and says, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. All right? It's a character word. And so story begins, story shifts. There's someone of this clan that is a worthy man. Okay? Let me keep going. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she, watch this, happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who once again, like, like author wants to restate, was of the clan of Elimelech, Elimelech. Okay, so Ruth is like, hey, we need some food. I'm going to go glean in a field. Now, what does that word glean mean? Okay, glean, um, in the ancient world and among God's people, God wanted to provide a way for people who were poor or destitute or in need to be able to survive. And so he said, we're going to allow this system called gleaning. And here's what it was, if you're not familiar with it. If you owned a field and you were harvesting a field, it says in Deuteronomy, you have to leave some of the edges. You got you to gotta leave a little wheat. You got to leave a little barley so that poor people and widows can actually have a chance to follow after the fields have been harvested and they can have something to eat. Okay, now it wasn't much. One commentator said it was probably about kind of ancient world concept of like, like collecting aluminum cans and, you know, turn them in, getting a little bit of food. Like, it wasn't much. And it wasn't certainly a handout. But if you were willing to work for it, if you were willing to put some effort, you would survive. Because God said, let people glean, okay? And if you look back at the text, it says, she went to glean, and like Ron pointed out last week, she happened... Of all the fields in Israel, of all the plots in Israel, of all the land of Israel, she happened to wind up in Boaz's field. Now, that word happened is like this sort of Hebrew satirical word that's kind of saying, yeah, like happened, like obviously this wasn't a chance. Obviously God was in it. And I, I don't know about you, but when... I look back at my life of all the things that seemed random, like people I've met or places I've been or things that in the moment didn't seem like much. And I look back kind of in the rearview mirror, I can be like, oh, God, thank you that you're a sovereign God, that in the middle even of the mystery, you are working things out for your glory and my good, like you love me. And there is no coincidental happenings with the sovereign God of the universe that loves you and is working out all things for his glory. Amen. Do you know the happenings of God? So we've got Ruth, and she shows up, and she happens to glean. Okay, so watch this. Verse 4. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Just pause for a second. Here's this like worthy, awesome boss, CEO guy. Can you picture like a company where the guy walks in and like greets everybody like, the Lord bless you. And all the workers say, and the Lord be with you. Like, like does that happen in any of your workplaces? It doesn't? Yes? No? Like, this is this godly, strong character, blessing everybody dude named Boaz. Verse 4, they answered, the Lord bless you. Verse 5, the Boaz, then Boaz said to his young man, who is in charge of the reapers, 
whose young woman is this? Which I can translate that in biblical Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, whatever language, or just plain American English. This is what it means. Ready? Who's the girl? <laughs> Who is that? Okay. Yeah, buddy. Thank you. And let me tell you something. Uh, I think he was attracted to Ruth, for sure. But I can say something with authority in this text, that it went way deeper than just physical attraction. Let me just read something to you. Look, let me read verse 6 and 7. The servant who is in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Okay? Later in the text, we're going to hear that Boaz, Boaz has heard of this woman, this faithful woman, this serving woman, this caring woman. She had a reputation that was growing among the community of a woman who was clinging to the Lord and serving her mother-in-law. And he sees her, and the servants are like, she has been in the field all day working. She is this hard, hard worker. She is faithful. She's only taking one short little break. And something in the heart of Boaz, I think, just shifts. Now, now let me just pause and kind of step out of this story. Um, I have, those of you who know me and my wife, Ashley, I have a beautiful wife, okay? I am married to a mesmerizing woman. I am wildly in love with her, okay? Um, a couple weeks ago, we were at a wedding that I was officiating, and she put on this, like, beautiful wedding dress gown thing. I don't know what it like, like, shoes and this beautiful, like, dress and makeup and whatever. And anyways, she, I'm like, you are crazy beautiful, okay? Can I tell you what my wife and I also do? Um, some of you know this, but in our story right now, we have bought a small farm, and Ashley has planted 650 lavender plants and last week, we bought our first tractor. Can I get an amen from the rednecks of Lebanon? Like, like uh, and there are days, and in fact, there are a lot of days, where she's not in a wedding gown. She's in, like, her, like, Carhartt field clothes, and she is working early morning to late at night in the dirt, in the weeds, in the, like, mud everywhere, like, no makeup, like, like, hair, like, all over the place. And at the end of the day, I can also look at my beautiful wife and say, you are crazy beautiful. And let me tell you something. There is a difference between wedding gown beauty and field beauty. Do you know that? Like, there's a difference between when someone is in their most, like, Instagram pose-worthy, like, beautiful, like, like, and you've been working so hard. I see your heart. I see your character. And there's a beauty that rises up. Let me ask you something. When Boaz looked and saw Ruth, what did the text say? She had been working all day. She was sweaty, she was muddy, she was gleaning, she had only taken one break. This wasn't just wedding gown beauty, this was field beauty, okay? He'd heard of her, he'd seen her, and he saw her character that was rising up, all right? He heard her, he saw her, and so what did he do? Um, he pursued her, and let me, just, let me just pause for a second for the single ladies in the house, let me just tell you, let me just say this. You want to fall in love with a man who sees you, who loves your character more than your outer beauty. Guys, uh, and I feel like I'm talking sometimes now in my phase of life, um, a parent and a future, actually now a grandparent, praise the Lord, for those of you who don't know. Um, I'm speaking to my sons, and I'm speaking to my future generations, and I'm speaking to sons and daughters out here, and I'm saying, speak to those who have been married 
for 20, 25 years, 30 years, 35 years, and they will tell you the grass withers, the flowers fade, but there is an unending, rising beauty of character. Amen? There is character. You fall in love with that, all right? And Boaz sees it. So between verse 7 and verse 8, watch this. Like verse 8, Boaz said to Ruth, meaning Boaz goes past the other field workers, through the field. He comes to Ruth, and look at verse 8. Look what he says. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Let me translate that. He looks at Ruth and he says, I will provide for you. Don't go to another field. You stay here. I will provide for you. He says, I will protect you. Apparently in that day and age in the ancient world, um, it was not necessarily a safe place for a young woman to be in a worker's field. But Boaz looks at Ruth and says, you stay right here. I will provide for you. I will protect you. And that's actually shocking. Like, it's so shocking that, that like, ancient world, like, like, that he would be like, my young men are going to give you water. You are a Moabite. You're a foreigner. You're distant here. I'm actually going to provide and protect for you. So much that verse 10, watch what she says. She fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? But watch this. But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law, since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, how you left your father and your mother in native land and have come to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Okay. Boaz says, I've heard of you. I've seen you. I know your heart. I know your character. You are taking refuge under the very wings of God. And therefore, I will protect you. I will provide for you. You stay here. Okay? And mealtime uh, came around. Okay? Mealtime came around. Verse 14. And we say their first date. All right? Watch this. Verse 14. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and, and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. Okay. I want you to picture the scene. Okay. They're at mealtime, and the servants are way over there, and here's the table, and here's the head table. Here's the owner of the head table of the field, and he takes the initiative. He pursues her, and he says, you come here. I want you to eat at my table. And in fact, take some bread and dip it in this wine. I will protect you. I will provide for you. I will pursue you. And he gives her food, okay? And then the story just kind of keeps rolling along. We're going to keep reading verse 15. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men saying, hey, boys, come here. Help me out a little bit. Uh, Let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean. Do not rebuke her. Verse 17, so she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Let me pause. Let me help us out just a little bit. Um, An ephah of barley. Let me tell you what that was in the ancient world. An ephah was about one half 
to two-thirds of a bushel, okay? Let me help you more. Um, that equaled 30 to 50 pounds of barley, okay? Now, in the ancient world in Babylonia, the average ration for a day of a field worker was one to two pounds, okay? He left her enough food to have 30 to 50 pounds. He left her almost a month of provision. And one commentator who I was listening to said, look at verse 17. This is how we know that uh, Ruth did some CrossFit here. She hoists it up on her shoulders. I want you to picture big, you know, tough mutter, feel beauty Ruth. Hoists 50 pounds on her shoulders. She goes back to Bethlehem. She goes back to Naomi. And Naomi looks at her in the next verse. Naomi is like, blessed be the Lord. What has happened? Wait a second. What man did you find that helped you? And look at how, look at how the text unrolls. Watch this. Verse 19, and her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? Where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law in whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. All right? And when she said that, something in Naomi, I don't know if it was like light bulb went on, something shifted, something happened, because Naomi almost loses it with such joy and excitement that she gives verse 20. And of all the places we're going to look today, verse 20 is the most important verse. And there's two words in verse 20 that I'm going to ask you to underline or highlight. I'm going to ask you to think about, meditate on, take notes on. Because these two words are not only the, the two most important words in this book, but these are two of the most important words in the entire Bible. Okay? So don't miss verse 20. Here we go. Ready? And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord, whose, here's the first word, watch this, circle this, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. Okay? The word kindness and the word redeemer. First of all, the word kindness. Circle that word. It's the Hebrew word hesed. Okay? In fact, would you just, would you just say it with me? It's such an important word. Ready? Hesed. Okay? It's a word biblically that is so rich and deep and, and hard to define. It's a word biblically where you look through the Old Testament and you come across this word and there's often all kinds of different words that, that the English authors use to write this word. So, for example, sometimes you'll see the word loving kindness. Sometimes you'll see the word covenant faithfulness. Sometimes you'll see the word mercy. Uh, sometimes you'll see the word grace, okay? All over the Bible, when you find it, it's like, what is this word that means something like love, something like grace, something like mercy, something like the loving kindness, faithfulness of God? This is a word for the love of God, all right? Um, Jesus Storybook Bible, Sally Lloyd-Jones. I love this. If you're reading this to your kids, please read this to your kids, this book. She calls it the unending Never stopping, unbreaking, always and forever love. Okay? And look back at this text because something very fascinating happens. Look at verse 20. Naomi says, May he be blessed by the Lord whose hesed has not forsaken the living or the dead. And there's kind of a debate about this verse. Okay? Look at, look at that text. Whose hesed? And here's the question. Is Naomi talking about the Lord or is Naomi talking about Boaz? All right? May he be blessed by the Lord whose hesed has not forsaken us. And can I tell you passionately what I think it is? What I think it is and what other Bible scholars I respect say it is? 
It's both. All right? Naomi is like, thank the Lord in this action. Like, here's our first major problem. We don't, we don't have food. We don't have connection. But somebody has provided for us. We've experienced loving kindness. We've experienced grace. We've experienced mercy that we could never, ever earn. We've experienced hesed reflected through Boaz. All right? Boaz is a reflection of the very love of the hesed of God. And again, I just want to I just want to now speak to a little bit of the the uh, those in the crowd that are saying I feel like a lot of times as we preach throughout the year, we talk about marriage, we talk about but I get this moment to kind of address those in the crowd who are singles. And I just want to pause and say this. Um, to the men in the crowd, to the young men, to the single men. Um, this is what I take so far from this text, okay? Even if you're like a sixth grader, seventh grader, young man, student, wherever you are, I want you to hear this. One day, here's what I take from Boaz, ready? You listen for and look for a girl whose character is even greater than her outer beauty. You pursue a girl, and then watch this. You pursue her, you protect her, you provide for her, and you display the hesed love of God to her, okay? Young ladies, like, like what kind of guy would, would you be one day called by the Lord to fall in love with? A guy that is saying, I will pursue you, I will protect you, I will provide for you, I will display the hesed love of God to you. All right. This summer, I've done a couple weddings. Uh, in about a week or so, Caleb Ramos is going to be married. And you're going to be standing up in front, and I'm going to look you in the eyes, and I'm going to say, you display the Hesed love of God to Eliza. You be a reflection of this love. And it's a call to everybody in this room who's in a relationship who's married. Let us be ones like, like Boaz, men. It's never too late to apologize and to say, I've fallen short. God, I want to be a reflection of the hesed love of God to my wife. You love her with an unending, unbreaking, always and forever, the kindness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God coming from God reflected to me, through me to her. That's the kind of guy you want to marry, young ladies. That's the kind of husband that I want to be, okay? And just quickly to speak to the ladies, it seems like um, the primary focus of Ruth's life was to cling to the Lord and to be faithful where God placed her. And then she met a man who was willing to pursue her, protect her, provide for her, and display hesed to her. Naomi heard it. Naomi lost her mind. She's like, wait a second, that's Hesed, and don't miss this. He could be a redeemer. Look at the second word, a redeemer. It's so important for this story. It's so important for the Bible. Ready? Here's what a redeemer is, okay? Let me trace it biblically just a little bit. The word redeem means something like to buy back into freedom. It means to pay a price to buy back something that's lost. It means when somebody is in, in bondage or captivity, to pay a price to set that person free. It means when somebody is destitute and lost their land, to pay a price to buy it back. And the implication of redemption is I will sacrificially pay a price, and with that price that I pay, I will provide for you. I will protect you. I will pay a price sacrificially to give you freedom that what once was lost has now been redeemed. Do you see that? And Naomi was like, wait a second. Not only is he showing you hesed, he could be a redeemer. Okay? And so here's what Naomi does. Naomi, the quintessential mother-in-law, 
Look at me, mother-in-laws. Mother-in-laws in the crowd. You know you're there. She goes mother-in-law mode, and she starts planning, okay? She starts scheming out, all right? Look at chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? That word rest is the Hebrew word for the rest that a wife experiences under the protection and provision of a husband. Ultimately, Naomi looked at Ruth and said, It's time we found you a man. All right? Watch this. Is not Boaz our relative with whose young woman you, you were? See, he... Now, here's her plan. Ready? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Verse 5. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. Okay, let me just unpack this. Naomi's like, it's time to enact our plan. Here's our plan. First of all, Ruth. Look back at the text. First of all, Ruth, you need to wash yourself and anoint yourself, meaning it's time to let go of the, you know, field girl car hearts and bring out your feminine charm. Here we go. Ready? Game on. You need to take a shower. You know, wear perfume. You need to do whatever it is you do. I don't know, ladies, what's behind this, but, but you need to wash yourself, anoint yourself, put on a cloak. It's game time. Boaz tonight will be at a party. He will be winnowing barley. And when he has eaten, when, he's, when he eats, drinks, celebrates, harvest time, party's done, go to sleep, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go up where he is sleeping, observe where he's sleeping, pull off his covers, lay at his feet, and when he wakes up, he will tell you what to do, okay? Now, if you're slightly blushing inside, you should be. This is, one scholar said this is a risque, bold, borderline, shady, like if you're watching a movie with your family, you're like, get the fast forward button out. Is this about to be a bad scene? Like, like cover your eyes. Like, that's what you would have been saying in the ancient world too. She's like, you... Uncover him, lay at his feet, and he will tell you what to do. Observe where he's laying. You do not want to do this, Ruth, to the wrong man. That would be awkward. <laughs> Observe where he lays. Go and do this. And Ruth is like, look at verse 5. She goes, okay, I'll do it. Now watch this. Verse 6 through 9. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Let me just unpack that. Ruth gets ready. It's party time. She goes she goes incognito. She waits. She watches. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be at that party watching him in the background? She watches. He goes and lays down. She comes up to his feet, 
takes the covers off of him. Let me just pause. Are any of you in a marriage where your spouse steals the covers? Anybody? I see no hands. No one's willing to admit it. All right. Steals the covers, puts it over her, which was this incredible symbol in the ancient world. All right. All of a sudden, he, he, midnight, he wakes up, and hello, there is a woman laying at his feet, and he says, who are you? Like, like what, is, what is happening? Who are you? If you remember the story, Naomi said, you just like, like he'll tell you what to do. Ruth goes off script here, okay? Ruth is bold, like our, our sweet little Moabite, gentle, shy, like loving Ruth. Something gets into her because Ruth says this. Ruth says, would you cover me with your wings? Have we heard that before? You remember chapter 2? Boaz said to Ruth, I've heard of you, that you've taken covering under the wings of the Lord. Ultimately, here's what Ruth was saying. Just like the Lord protects, just like the Lord provides, just like I can take refuge under the Lord, will you continue to show the hesed of the Lord to me. She says, Boaz, you are a redeemer. And please don't miss this. I've seen you provide. I've seen you protect. Now, Boaz, will you pay the price and sacrificially buy me as your wife? Here's, here's what Ruth said. Don't miss this. Will you marry me? That's what Ruth said. And there's a collective, like, like, pause, gasp. Like, how's he going to respond? Like, like, little, like, by the way, like, you have no idea how bold this was. This was a woman to a man. This was a servant girl to the owner. This was a Moabite to an Israelite. You name a social, like, sector here, the entire social status has been flipped. She just proposed to the owner, man, Israelite Boaz and said, will you be my redeemer? Okay? And watch how he responds. Verse 10. And he said, collective pause, ready? May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first and that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. And let me just read a little bit of verse 14. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. Okay. All right. So ultimately, Boaz says, Yes, I will marry you. I have protected you. I've provided for you. And now I will pay the price to redeem you that you would be my wife. But there is another kinsman redeemer closer than me. So in the morning, we're going we're gonna to ask him. If he wants to do it, he'll do it. If not, I'll do it. Why don't you go back to sleep, Ruth? We'll wake up in the morning and by the way, I, don't, I can't say this with authority. It's not in the text. But do you think Ruth slept that night? <laughs> like, in the morning, she's getting married. It's either to some dude she has never met or it's to Boaz who she's laying at his feet. All right? In the morning, everything will change. And I'm not going to end the story for you now, okay? We're going to go back to this love story next week. 
I'm just going to ask the question, do you think in the heart of God, do you think in the very heart of God, that this destitute, poor woman who is in sin land Moab, who makes a decision saying, I'm going to trust in you, Lord. I'm clinging to you, Lord. Even though I have nothing, could go to a place and actually experience the hesed love of a man and the redemption price paid from a man who says, I will protect you, provide for you, and pay a price to set you free. Do you think it's in the heart of God that he would do that? And I want to close with this. Um, I want to close with this. It's so important. In fact, it's the main point, okay? You remember when I said that everything in the Old Testament, every symbol, every verse, every character, it's meant to whisper forward and point forward to not just the micro story of this love story, but the macro story of the love of God. And so I want you just to pause for a moment because this is where it hits our life. Does this word hesed and does this word redeemer apply to us? And here's what I would say. Biblically, every person in this room, including me, we have lived in Moab, all right? We've turned our back from God. We've strayed from God. We've hardened our heart before God. We're in the shame and sin of Moab, all right? But the loving God of the universe has said, I actually want to make you a part of my family. There's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that you can earn. I want to show my hesed love for you. And I don't know if you caught this scene. But remember, Boaz is like, won't you come to my table, dip your bread in my wine? There's a God who's saying, I want to show my hesed love to you. And my body and blood of my son was broken and poured out that you could experience his hesed love. And there's a God that says, I want to show redemption to you. Though you were lost, I'm paying a price. Though you were in bondage and captivity, I'm setting you free. And the big story, which is our big story, is that if we are followers of Jesus Christ, we've been redeemed. Do you see that? If we're followers of Jesus Christ, the living God of the universe is saying, I will pay your redemption price. By the blood of my son, I love you. I protect you. I will provide for you. I'm paying a price to set you free. Please, everybody, this is the main point. Don't miss this. We'll go back to this next week. I don't know if you caught this. You are Ruth. Let me say that again. In this story, I am Ruth. In this story, we are Ruth. And the living God of the universe who loves us with a hesed love, a forever love, an unchanging love, an unbending love is symbolized by Boaz. He's saying, I want to love you with a hesed love and I'll pay a redemption price for you, there's a God who loves you more than you realize. And he wants to be in a forever relationship with you. And he's made a proposal. Do you want to experience the hesed redeeming love of God? Let me pray for us. God, we love you. We, we worship you as the God who, who has shown us hesed. We praise you as the God who sent your son to bleed and die, to pay our redemption price. I thank you, Father, that, that though I've been in Moab so many times, though my sin was great, your grace is greater. I thank you, God, for your unending, uh, unchanging, unbreaking love. I thank you, God, that, that when you relate to us, biblically, you call it a marriage. That you are the groom and, and your church is your bride. And you want us to know you and love you and walk with you. I thank you that there's a heavenly Boaz whose name is Jesus. And 
you are our kinsman redeemer. And so God, we just, we just love you. And we thank you for this story that we find ourselves in. Father, would you teach us how to receive that hesed love and how to walk in your redemption. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Hey, we're going to go into a time of communion. Um, and I would just ask you for this communion time that you would dwell with the Lord and you would just think about this great love story. And if you're a follower of Jesus, um, when you take communion today, I want you to, by the way, if you didn't get your communion elements, they're over there. Um, come and grab some. When you take your communion today, um, I would like you to actually take the little wafer and dip it into the juice, just as this Boaz Ruth symbol of God has provided the bread of life. God has provided the, the blood of Jesus that washes us free. Take that symbol and rejoice in the love that he has given to you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And then we're going to close in worship. So would you, would you spend some time humbling yourself? Be before the Lord. Spend some time with him. If there's any areas of your life right now that you would say, that feels like Moab, here's a moment to repent before the Lord. And then take communion and celebrate his great love for you. And we will close. We'll close in worship. Let me pray over us. God, would you meet us now as we take communion? Would you just whisper your love over us? Would you show us the Boaz love of our kinsman redeemer? We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. When the moment's right, take communion and we will close in worship.